Astronomy to GCSE, Topic 2.2, Comets and Meteors. So 1. I explained what a comet was in Topic 2.1, but now how a comet's orbits different to those of the planets. Well, a comet has a highly eccentric orbit. This means that it is a very long and thin ellipse. This is the orbit of Halley's Comet to scale. I've had to enlarge the Sun and Halley's Comet so you can actually see them, but still, what is obvious from this is that the orbit of Halley's Comet is definitely not circular. Some comets don't take relatively long to complete one orbit. For instance, Halley's Comet only takes 75 years. These comets that orbit the Sun in less than 200 years are called short period comets. These comets come from an area of the solar system called the Kuiper Belt. So where is the Kuiper Belt? In this diagram, the sizes of the objects are not to scale, but the distances between them are. So the Sun is focused on the left, and then in the centre we have the orbit of Neptune. And here is the Kuiper Belt. Now, although there may be hundreds of thousands of objects larger than 100 kilometres wide in the Kuiper Belt, the mass of the rest of the solar system is nothing compared to that of the Sun, which contains an estimated 99.8 or 99.9% .9 of the total solar system's mass. So that's where the Kuiper Belt is, and that is also where all of the short period comets come from. If there are short period comets, there must be long period comets too. These have orbits that take longer than 200 years, and these comets come from the most distant part of our solar system, the Oort cloud. Now, I tried to fit it onto the slide along with the Kuiper belt, but after a bit of time I realised that it was actually impossible. So I'll show you the beginning of the Oort cloud. The Kuiper belt, where the short period comets come from, ends at about 55 astronomical units, but the Oort cloud starts at around 5,000. This then continues to 100,000 astronomical units. It takes the light from the Sun nearly two Earth years to reach the outer parts of the Oort cloud. In the outer extent of the Oort cloud, the Sun's gravitational influence is as weak as other nearby stars. That's how far away the outer edge of the Oort cloud is. I'll click, I will quickly add that we've never directly observed the Oort cloud, but there is strong evidence to support its existence. Some of this evidence is that the short period comets from the Kuiper belt c only come in and around the plane of the ecliptic, whereas the long period comets come from all directions, and by observing their path we can calculate their aphelion, their furthest point from the Sun. This tends to be um, distances like 50,000 astronomical units away. This means that the Kuiper belt is a plane, like the main asteroid belt, just bigger and the Oort cloud is a cloud of objects surrounding the solar system in all directions, and it's very far away. So, to recap the orbits of comets. Short period comets have orbits under 200 years, and they come from the Kuiper belt. Their orbits are not very inclined to the ecliptic. Long period comets have orbits over 200 years, and come from the Oort cloud, the orbits of long-period comets can be very inclined to the ecliptic. 2. Let's take apart a comet and learn about its different parts. The nucleus of a comet is, as I described in Topic 2.1, made of mainly ice, dust and rock. When the comet is near its aphelion out in the Kuiper belt or the Oort cloud, that is all there is to it. But as it approaches the Sun and its perihelion, something interesting starts to happen. The energy being emitted by the Sun heats up the comet. This means that the ice in the nucleus begins to melt. This creates a spherical cloud, if you like, around the comet. This is called a coma. When the comet is even closer, it gets even hotter. This means that more ice is melting and then evaporating, causing two tails. The first is the ion tail also called a type 1 tail. It is a long tail which is made from ionised gas. It is ionised because it is excited by the solar wind. The ion tail is always pointing away from the sun because it is affected by the solar wind so much. The second, the second tail is a curved dust tail. This broad light coloured tail is made of dust and small rock particles. 
It is very reflective, so it appears a light colour in the sky. The tails of comets are millions of kilometres long. In fact, the ion tail has previously been observed at approximately 570 million kilometres long. 3. Meteors, meteoroids and meteorites. What are they, how do they differ, and where do they come from? Let's start with what this object is before we try and classify it. NASA calls them little chunks of rock and debris in space. They are rocks and or metallic bodies that travel through space and are formed by either the collisions of asteroids in space, being ejected by another body, or from the tail of a comet. The boundaries between a little asteroid and a meteoroid is vague, but a meteoroid is a lump of rock that varies in size from a dust particle to a boulder. So now we know what they are, let's try and attribute these names to their owners. A meteoroid is the standard one, if you like, a lump of rock floating around in space. A meteor is a meteoroid that has entered the Earth's atmosphere. The meteor is going so fast that the friction between its surface and the air in the atmosphere is so great that it is heated and it begins to glow. This is often called a shooting star, as it appears to be a star that is flying across the sky. If a meteor is very bright, then it is called a fireball. The technical definition of a fireball is a meteor with an apparent magnitude of negative 3 or greater. The final type is a meteorite. A me this is a meteor that has landed on the surface of Earth. The best way to remember is that a meteoroid is in space, a meteor in the atmosphere, a fireball, a bright meteor, and a meteorite has landed. 4. Meteor showers. Meteor showers are when there are a large number of meteors, aka shooting stars or fireballs, that occur on one night. An example of these are the Orionids. These meteor showers only occur at certain times of the year, and there's a good reason for it. Meteor showers are associated with a comet's orbit. When a comet comes around the sun, they leave particles of dust and rock as they go. These particles then move around the orbit of the comet. At certain times of the year, the orbit of planet Earth will cross the orbit of the comet and bump into these lone particles. As there are lots of meteoroids, this creates a meteor shower. All of the meteors diverge, aka come from the same point in the sky. This is called the radiant. The reason this happens is because they are all on the same or very similar orbits around the sun. 5. PHOs, also called Potentially Hazardous Objects A potentially hazardous object is an asteroid or comet that has the potential to make a close approach to Earth, and if it collided, it would cause significant regional damage or worse. PHOs orbit within 0.05 astronomical units of the orbit of Earth. They also have a diameter of at least 100 to 150 metres. Over a thousand potentially hazardous objects have been identified, and we don't really want to have a collision, as this may damage infrastructure, urban areas, farmlands, animals and plants' habitat, as well as causing loss of both animals' and humans' lives. To prevent any of that happening, PHOs are closely monitored. A PHO may only destroy a single city, which is quite bad, but it is also now thought that dinosaurs were killed by a collision with an asteroid 65 million years ago. A collision with one of the larger PHOs may cause a similar event, but don't worry, NASA are keeping an eye on all of them. 6. How do astronomers gather evidence of impacts between bodies in our solar system so they can consider their effects? There are signs that a large impact has taken place in our solar system. I will list a few for you now. A crater. There are lots of these on the moon, other planets, asteroids, and on Earth itself. These are all evidence of impacts. Some of these can allow us to investigate further. For example, we can look at the size of the crater. If a meteorite remains, we can look at that. We can also look at the abundance of craters in an area. Another e a sign is the moon. The moon is an evidence of a very large impact in the early days of the solar system. The rock collected by the Apollo lunar missions gives us evidence of that. 
The remains of comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 collided with Jupiter after it was ripped apart by Jupiter's gravity. There are even videos on YouTube of this collision. And finally, Uranus. Uranus rotates on its side relative to the ecliptic and its own orbit. This could be evidence of a major impact in the early days of the solar system that moved the rotational axes of, Earth, of Uranus significantly. That is the end of Astronomy to GCSE, Topic 2.2, Comets and Meteors. Thanks for listening and watching.